The idea is what would our church look like if we were truly an open house? That's what we are. We are a house that is open. Matter of fact, when you, when you came in tonight, did, did, did anybody check your ID? Nobody checked your ID? Man, we got to work on it. Anybody check your credit score before you came in here tonight? No. Anybody check your, 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 your outfit before you came in? No, no. You just, you just came in. This is truly an open house. Isn't that the beauty of the church? That this is an open house that all who are thirsty, all who are weary can come in and find a space and a place. It's an open house. House. Somebody say open house. This is what trips me out. Even in the realtor world, whenever a house is on the market, they'll have an open house and anybody can come in. You walking all in the house, credit score five, but just <laughs> looking all in the house. They don't, they don't check. They just let anybody, it even nosy neighbors who are not even going to buy the house. They just want to see how your, that house compares to their house. And they will be all up in the house just, oh, yeah, yeah, ours is bigger. Yeah, uh-huh. All in the house. And that's the idea that we would be an open house, that whosoever would want to come in can come into this church. Now, houses are different. Houses are different. I don't know if you knew this about us, and we're going to be very intentional over this month so that you know what kind of house this is. We have house rules here at Social, just three house rules, and we're going to be going over them over these next few weeks. We say that we are a house of prayer. Somebody say prayer. We're a house of prayer. In fact, this Tuesday night, we're going to have prayer right here at Gillies. And I'm telling you, every move of God has always started when people get together and understand the power of prayer prayer. We are first and foremost the house of prayer. We're also a house of presence. Come on, how many are thankful when you come into social, you feel more than the air conditioning? Come on, somebody. The tangible presence of God is here. We're a house of presence. And we're also a house for people, for people, all kinds of people, everybody has a seat at the table. So this is going to be a great series. You're going to get insider information about our church, and I want to jump off right into this series tonight. I want you to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. Somebody say, open house. Look at the neighbor you've ignored this whole service. Look at them right in their face and say, oh, neighbor, you know this is an open house. Tell them, tell them, it's an open house. We got security, but it's still an open house. I want to look at the gospel according to Mark chapter 11. Mark 11, and I want to look at verses 12 through 21. Mark 11, I'll start at verse number 12, we'll go all the way down to verse number 21. How many of you brought like a real Bible to church, a paper Bible to church? Ooh, I always like to see y'all, y'all the super saved people. Come on, still got your paper Bible. Mark chapter 11, We'll start at verse number 12. When you're ready to read it, say, yeah. If you're not ready, say, hold on. All right, I'll wait for that. Hold on. This is an interesting passage of Scripture. Look at what it says. It says, the next day as they were leaving, that they as Jesus and his disciples, they were leaving Bethany. Jesus was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. And when he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. He would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. As he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of... Is this as if Jesus knew the social house rules. He said, It's a house of... Not a house of preaching. Not a house of jumping up and down. Not a house of turning up. Not a house even of singing. All that is necessary, all that is good, but only Jesus can define what his house is. And he is defining his house clearly and plainly. He says, my house is a house of prayer 
for all nations. He says, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. I bet they did. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When the evening came, Jesus and disciples went out of the city. And in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said, there's always a Peter in the group that got to say something. Can't never be quiet. Jesus, <laughs> Rabbi, look. The fig tree you cursed has withered. What a weird passage of Scripture. This kind of breaks up any notions or any images you have of this, like, blonde hair, blue-eyed Jesus who walks around with this little Botox smile that just says, hello, yes, and just preaching about love. No, this is a Jesus who is cursing trees and flipping tables and kicking people out the church. Woo, I love it. I love it. I'm serious about my titles. I'm very serious about my titles. And I got in a fight with our creative director, Frank. Got in a fight because I wanted to use a title. I wanted to use a title that I thought was befitting for this text. It is clear in this text that this fig tree and the house, his house, are connected. And I wanted to use a little edgy title. And they said, no, you can't use that title. But I made a slide for it anyway. This is not my real title. But if I wanted to title it what I wanted to title it before I got voted out, I Almost, I almost, this ain't the real title, but I almost titled this message, Get the Fig Out My House. Get the Fig Out My House. That's my fake title. That would have been good clickbait. Everybody would have been clicking on that on Monday. Like, what is that about? But that's not my real title. Take it down. Take it down. Um, just my simple title tonight. My simple title tonight is the first house rule of social that we are a house of prayer. A house of prayer. Just house of prayer. Look at your neighbor for the last time and say, oh, neighbor. Say, oh, neighbor, this right here is a house of prayer. Look at the neighbor you completely ignored. Say, other neighbor, I didn't talk to you first because you looked weird. But that's all right. <laughs> this is still a house of prayer. Would you give God like five seconds of crazy praise if you know he's going to speak to you tonight? Like real praise, like you're expecting for God. You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. My house shall be called a house of prayer. Social fam, two weeks ago was a significant week in the Madhu household. It was a significant week because it was the week before the last week in August. You ought to know right now that for all of my life, I am busy on the week before the last week in August. I, don't, I, have, I have plans. I have commitments because whew, that is the week that we celebrate our anniversary and we celebrate my wife's birthday. Come on, somebody. We always celebrate. It's the same week. We have anniversary, birthday, back to back every single year. It's a whole week of celebration. And I was reminiscing over our journey together and looking through some pictures, and I was thinking about the vast difference between the first year we celebrated the anniversary and the birthday and this year. Because this year we celebrate nine years of marriage, nine years of marriage, and my boo turned, can I say it, 34 years old, girl. 34 and fine. I think you a cougar now. She's 34. <laughs> So we celebrated that, and I was just laughing about the difference between year one and year nine. Completely different, <laughs> incredibly different. Like year one was extra, it was extra. I mean, we did a whole bunch of things. It was so extra, it was exotic. I mean, come on, we had a private dinner on the beach. We had a private dinner. Look at that young couple in love, don't know nothing, just one year, and had a private dinner on the beach. I mean, we went horseback riding. That girl got me on a horse on the beach. This is the first year, very exotic. We, we swam with dolphins. Swam with dolphins. I take that back. She swam with dolphins. <laughs> I saw Jaws. I stayed on the side. I said, don't let that dolphin bite your face off. But it, it, was, it was amazing. It was incredible. But year nine hit different. Year nine was completely different. We have three little humans now. You want to know what we did for our anniversary two weeks ago? Year nine. You ready? First of all, my parents came and got all three of our kids and took them. And then we, 
You ready? We stayed home. That's it. <laughs> we stayed at the house, chilled at the house, and it was incredible. There was a moment, I'll never forget it, we're in the house, just us, and I said, babe, do you hear that? She's like, I don't hear anything. I said, exactly. <laughs> stayed at the house, had an amazing time. Then a birthday came, and we took it up a notch for the birthday. We did not stay home for the birthday. We went to a hotel here in Dallas, had a little staycation, and we checked into a hotel. Let me pause right here and say, how many know it is amazing to check into a hotel? Anybody love checking into, I'm talking about like a good hotel, a nice hotel. Oh, I love the hotel experience. We went to the spa. It was incredible. Had this little plush terry cloth robe. We walked in, had a couple's massage, got hit with lavender, eucalyptus, smelled like Christmas in there, frankincense, oil, and myrrhs. Got a couple's massage. It was amazing. We went into the room of the hotel. We had views of the city of Dallas, we prayed for the city. I cut on all the lights in the hotel room because you know you act different in a hotel than you do at home. <laughs> Come on, when I am at home, I am a frugal environmentalist. I'm like, cut off all these lights. The kids are like, it's cold, put a blanket on. <laughs> They're like, it's hot, close your mouth, close your eyes, you won't be hot. The electric bill is hot, but when I'm in a hotel. Oh, cut on all these lights, turn it down to 62 at night. Finish taking a shower, you dry off with eight towels at a hotel. <laughs> It's an amazing experience. We had room service brought to the room. It was so good. I love this hotel. It was funny though, after the two nights at the hotel, guess what we did? We did what you do. We went to the front desk, we checked out, and we went back home. We went back home. And I was thinking about that because I've stayed at a lot of hotels in my life. And have you noticed that no matter how beautiful the hotel no matter how great the amenities, a hotel can never compare to your house. Ooh, it can never compare to your home. I don't care how good it is. You can stay at the best hotel. You can stay at the greatest Airbnb, but I promise you there's gonna come a moment while you're staying there where you're like, I, right. it's cool. <laughs> I have got to get home. People, I have stayed in hotels that had the same mattress that is in my house, but the sleep was not the same. Mine is already fitted and contoured to my body. It goes in where I go in. I want to be in my bed because there is something in us that always wants home. In fact, scientists that have studied sleep will let you know that your body sleeps different when you're not at home. Did you know this? They call it the struggle of the first night. If you've ever been restless, it's because even when your eyes are closed and you're sleeping, your body can't even get into a deep sleep because your brain and your body knows this is not home. This is not home. It's like your body and your brain is telling you why you're sleeping. You better not sleep too deep because <laughs> this is not your house. And I've been thinking about this. I feel like a lot of believers today, a lot of people who profess to be followers of Jesus, have completely forgotten that this earth is not our home. I think we've gotten comfortable in this hotel called earth, and we have forgotten that the Bible is clear that if you have put your faith in Jesus, please don't ever get it twisted. You are not a citizen of this earth. You are a citizen of heaven. This is not your home. Heaven is your home. That's why the Bible tells you things like don't be conformed to the patterns, the system, the culture of this earth. Why can I be conformed? Form. Why do I have to be transformed? Because this is not your home. You have another place of residence. Heaven is your home. You were created to be in the presence of God. And although this hotel called earth is okay, it will never compare to the true place that my soul was created to be in. This is not my home. I'm telling you, you will continually and perpetually be frustrated in life if you think this is home. Oh, th this is not home. And I think some of us have forgotten Matthew 6, And if we haven't forgotten it, we've inverted it because it says, seek first the kingdom of God 
And all these things will be added to you, but seek first the kingdom and its righteousness. But it's like we've inverted the scripture and said, well, let's seek first all the things and then maybe the kingdom will be added later. And there is nothing more dangerous and detrimental when there's something in your life that's supposed to be the priority and you make it secondary. Ooh, you want to ruin your life? You want to live with a skewed perspective? Then start treating temporal things like they're eternal and start treating eternal things like they are temporal. Life is about having the right priority. And I'm telling you, if you have put your faith in Jesus, God wants you to live in the reality that this earth is not my home. Heaven is my true home. I love the city of Dallas, but it's not my home. I love the country of Texas but it is not my home. My dad is from Nigeria. I am an Igbo man. There is Nigerian blood running through my veins. I have been to Nigeria, but that is still not my home. Heaven is my home, and I'm telling you, there is coming a day, a moment, and a twinkling of an eye when my God and your Savior is going to split the sky, and he's going to take us up to be with him, and when I see him, I will give him praise and glory and honor, and I will know that this is is not my home. I've always been created to be with you. Oh, why do you feel different when you feel his presence here? Because this is your home. His presence is your home. Heaven is your home. And just for a brief moment here, when we reach his presence, it's like our soul has a familiarity because we know I was not created for this earth. I just want to tell somebody, if you want to leave the message early, this earth is not your home. Don't start painting the walls of the hotel. Because this is not home. This is not home. And we forget it. We show sure forget it every election year. We really think that this is home. And we forget there is a kingdom of which I belong. And I'll always feel somewhat out of place because this isn't my house. This isn't where I live. This is what God has always been trying to get us to understand is where our true home is. And if you don't understand that it's not until we get to heaven that some of the things that you face on earth will make sense. You'll live in frustration. You'll live in anxiety. You'll be depressed. Many of us right now don't even have perspective on our trials because we don't live with the hope of eternity. How many you know when you understand the hope of eternity, it might not even change your situation, but it'll give you perspective on it. Come on, that's what Paul did in Romans 8, 18, didn't he? He said, I've reckoned. He said, I've considered that the present sufferings of this world are not worthy to what? Be compared to the glory of God that shall be revealed in me. In other words, I'm going through something right now that I hate, that I can't stand, but I understand I can face the trial because this is not the end. Even if God doesn't redeem it in the earth, there is coming a day where it will be redeemed. It will give you perspective on your trials. Oh, okay, you, you don't believe me. Let me see if I can do this illustration real quick. My man right here on the front row, what's your name? Marcus. Would you stand up real quick, Marcus? Yeah. And, and what's your name? Tell me one more time. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, stand up. Yeah. Marcus and Jeremiah. I just want to use your example to show you that even your trials will have perspective if you understand that you have eternal hope, that this is not the end, that everything you see is not really what you see. There is another kingdom. Can, can you imagine Marcus and Jeremiah? Can you imagine if I told both of you that uh, I need you to clean the floor of Gillies. You gotta clean the floor. I'm gonna give you this job offer to clean the floor of Gillies. But I'm not giving you a mop. I'm giving you a toothbrush. And you got to clean every square inch of this floor at Gillies with a toothbrush. But I tell you, Jeremiah, that when you finish cleaning the floor with a toothbrush, I'm gonna hand you a check. I can't pay you up front the way my bank account is set up. I'm gonna pay after, but I promise you, I'm gonna hand you a check for $500, 500, you clean every square inch with a toothbrush. Marcus, I tell you the same thing. Every square inch with a toothbrush. But Marcus, when you finish, I'm handing you a check for $5 million. Whew, he said, hallelujah. 
And I tell both of you this in private. And you show up whoo, on toothbrush floor cleaning day, the same day. Jeremiah got an attitude. Doesn't he? Can you see him? So make no sense cleaning this big old floor. What, oh, what is that right there with a toothbrush? He's scrubbing and he's mad. And I promise you, you won't even get to the back of the room where you're like, man, bro, no, man, come on. A hundred? That's it? Man, forget this. The stimulus check was more than that. I can't do 500. You're going to have an attitude the whole time. But Marcus? Oh, oh, Marcus showed up early to Gillies. Marcus got an electric toothbrush. <laughs> talking about, bzzz, talking about, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, oh, happy day, when Jesus was. I mean, he's saying, doing the same job you're doing. What is the difference? He understands the magnitude and the weight of his reward. That ought to put worship in perspective for you. That ought to put life in perspective for you. That you can be going through hell right now. But please know that your God is watching and God is a good record keeper. And how many are thankful that in this life or in eternity, you will be rewarded for faithfulness. You will be rewarded for forgiving people who are nasty to you. You will be rewarded for showing up and saying, God, I trust you even when the circumstance doesn't change and it's going to be more than five million dollars. Thank God that I will see him in his glory, in his beauty, in his splendor. There's a reward that's worth the pain and the trial. I wish somebody would give us some praise like you're thankful that God is faithful. He will reward you. smiling while you cleaning with a toothbrush because I know what's coming on the other side of this. Y'all can sit down. I'm telling you, you will face trials and suffering different when you have eternal perspective. And you got to start living your life with an understanding that everything you can see is not all there is to be seen. There is another kingdom. There's more than the likes on the gram. There's somebody else who's watching every single thing. I cannot wait for heaven. I cannot wait for heaven. Because I am convinced that a lot of people that we celebrate right now, that we think, ooh, they it. And there's a bunch of people you don't know a clue who they are. And heaven's going to be a big reveal of who's the real, who's who. Ooh, heaven is really going to reveal who you should have been in awe of when you were in their presence. Heaven will be the reveal of the real green room. Because there are some people, you don't know their name. They've been in a secret place, but they are just as faithful. And God is watching, and he is a great record keeper. And there's coming a day where he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Thank you, because you did it. Even when man didn't give you the applause. He's watching. And some preachers and some churches in Afghanistan that have stepped into their reward. How do they have confidence? The stories are coming in right now. How are they singing praises before they get executed? Because they know this is not the end. They know this is not the end. They know there's something coming on the other side. And then I have a house. I have a home. And this is not it. It's at best a hotel. Ooh, can I take my time tonight? This is what Jesus is actually trying to articulate in John chapter 14. Can you put that on the screen? I want you to see this. This is Jesus. He's trying to get into the mind of his disciples that I am leaving, and it's better for you. And look at what he says. I think we should take heart and encouragement in this verse today. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Let not your hearts be troubled. You ever been going through somebody, going through something, and somebody's like, oh, don't stress about that. You're like, uh, it's my bill that's due on the 15th. <laughs> you ever had somebody just casually say, oh, oh don't let your heart be troubled. Uh, about him? I thought he was the one, girl. <laughs> you ever just been stressed about, don't, that's what he's hitting him with. He's about to leave. He says, let not your hearts be troubled. Look at what he follows it up with. Here's how you cannot let your heart be troubled. Believe in God, 
believe also in me. That's the remedy for not letting your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. Another translation says, trust in God, trust also in me. In other words, I'm only troubled to the degree that I trust. Some of you are so troubled because you haven't grown in your trust. But you can only get troubled to the degree that you trust. You're not troubled in that chair right now. Why? Because you trust it. Now, if that thing starts shaking on you, you'd be checking it, wouldn't you? I'm troubled. I don't know if it can hold me. But I'm only troubled to the degree that I church. And then look what he says. He's told, now he's giving him eternal perspective. He says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you will be with me also. What is he doing? He's trying to get them to understand this is not it. There's another house. There's another place. Now, if you proud Sunday school alumnus, you raised in church, you floated in the room, um, you had communion for breakfast. <laughs> then you've heard that verse before. And maybe you heard the King James Version. Remember the King James Version? It said, in my father's house are many what? Mansions. Mansions. Remember that? You're like, oh, some of y'all still right now like, yo, when I get to heaven, my mansion is going to be crazy. Remember, remember the song? Come and go with me to my... Come and go with me to my... Hey, it's a big, big... With lots and lots of... Hey, it's a big, big table with lots and lots of... I love doing stuff like that in Dallas. Because all the church people are like filling in the blank. <laughs> all the people ain't raising church been like, is that on the new Drake? Because I don't know. <laughs> it's cool. It's cool. All are welcome. <laughs> but it, it messed up my conception of what, what the house looked like because I started dreaming. I, I started dreaming about my mansion. I think they have a picture of it. I was like, yo, when I get to heaven, holla at your boy. I done preached a lot of sermons. My mansion about to be big. <laughs> You know, I messed up. I'm petty, too. I'm like, there's Christians that I know they love Jesus and they're going to heaven, too, but I just don't rock with them. I'm like, you ain't going to be up in my mansion. I'm going to have a gate around my stuff. <laughs> if I didn't like you on earth, you know I ain't going to like you up there, so just stay in your... <laughs> stay on your side of heaven. Don't come over here. Stay on your side of the Gold Street, player. Stay on your side. I know we both love him, but I don't like you. Let's stay. <laughs> I'm, playing. I'm playing. I'm petty. Any of your grandfather, pray for me. But that's, put that picture back up real quick. That is actually, that ain't, that's not the image Jesus is talking about because that house didn't exist in his day. When he says, then in my house, my father's house are many mansions, many rooms, that word translated is dwelling place. There's a lot of space. It's a, it's a dwelling place. He's actually trying to conjure up the imagery of what would happen in that time period when a father had a family and the father would build a house. And generally when the father's children got married, they didn't go live somewhere else. They actually came back to the father's house and they would build their house right within the community of the father's house. So before you know it, there would be all of these families that kept building on to one house that started with the father. And as all these houses would be added on, there would be an open court area, the father's house at the center, and all these additional rooms that have been added on. And it started with the father's house being in the center. Do you see what our savior is trying to get us to understand? He's saying in heaven, there's going to be a place where all of us are going to come together and our focus and our attention will be on him, will be on our savior and there's going to be a lot of rooms added on and every tribe and every nation and every tongue will have a room that's added on and all of our affection will be focused on the one who started it all. Father's house. See, that might not make you shout. Because there's some people who are God's kids that we have forgotten are his kids too. And although I was joking about it earlier, some of us really don't think some people are his kids. And that's why we act bougie and don't allow them in the house. I'm talking about the church now. So sometimes we treat people that are his kids. Like this one real estate agent I talked to who I never called back. 
Because I'm a rookie, I'm trying to buy this house. As soon as I talked to her, I said, yeah, I want to see this house. She said, um, you want to see that house? I said, yes, yeah, that house. And she kept making a big deal. Because she was like, well, let me see my schedule. Let me see. Uh, well, I'm booked next week. Yeah, I'm booked next week too. Uh -huh, yeah, I'm booked for a while. She's like, I might have some time to squeeze you in to see this house this week. But uh, do you have a pre-approval letter from the bank? Like, do you have money? She didn't say that, but her face was saying that. Like, dude, like, how is your credit? I don't. She was saying all that with her face. And she wanted the pre-approval letter before I could just go see it. I said, I just want to look. She's like, I know, but do you have the pre-approval letter? And it made me so mad. So I'm like, why are you making me jump through a hoop when I just want to see the house? When I just want to walk through? I just have some interest. Do you know how many people don't want to come in church because of nasty, mean, cantankerous Christians standing at the front door? Ah, do you have your pre-approval letter? <laughs> and make sure you have the funds before we let you. Thank God for a savior who says, I have an open house. I have an open house. Now there is one door for you to come in, but please believe that in my house is plenty of room. Now in that real estate agent's defense, I realized why she wanted the pre-approval letter. I know why she wanted it. Cause she didn't want somebody wasting her time. Mm, I feel her. She didn't want anybody wasting her time. Cause how you gonna walk through the house if you ain't even got the money to afford it. So that's why she was saying it. She's had some experiences. She didn't want anybody to waste her time. And I said that today because you will never understand the text that we just read in Mark chapter 11 until you understand time. Somebody just say time. Come on, say it like you had some coffee. Say time. Oh, you'll never understand Mark 11 until you understand time. Because Jesus is cursing trees and cleansing temples because it's the last week of his life. He's running out of time. This is not Jesus who just showed up, who turned the water into wine, was on the dance floor having a good time. No. This is Jesus who understands my time is running out. The cross is coming. And how many you know, if you're going to waste anything, don't waste your if you're going to waste anything of mine, please don't waste my time. I'd rather you waste my money. I'd rather you waste my gas. And you've seen these gas prices. <laughs> but please don't waste my time. When you waste somebody's time, you're wasting their life because they can never get it back. Time is the most precious commodity. And I want to parenthetically pause here and tell somebody who thinks you have a whole lot of time to accomplish your purpose that God is going to judge you for how you spent your time in the earth. Please understand that time is a precious commodity. You ain't got all day to step into your purpose. There is no such thing as free time, as downtime or spare time. You only got a lifetime to do the thing that God put you on the earth to do so stop wasting stop wasting time oh, I'm good let me, let me turn up for a little bit I'll wait till I'm 40 to step in my purpose for real tomorrow's not promised understand the value of time I love time because time will reveal what's important in your life that's why ain't nobody as honest as kids and old people you know little kid will tell you why is that on your nose because they don't have a concept of time. Old people, an old person will tell you what they really think. Somebody come in, don't got much on, they'll be thinking, oh my God, did she really wear that? And the old person, be, baby, why you ain't got no clothes on, baby? The old person knows they're running out of time. Jesus is cursing trees, cleansing the temple. Because he's like, I ain't got time. The cross is coming. He walks up to the tree. He sees it from a distance first, this fig tree. And he sees leaves on the tree. And he's already aware that he's running out of time. Add to that, remember what the first thing in the text said? He's hungry. <laughs> Only time in the Bible that it says Jesus was hungry. So he's running out of time, he's annoyed, and he's hungry. You ever been hungry and had somebody waste your time? You ever been angry and hungry at the same time? There is a word for this. You ever been hangry before? This is the mood of this text. And he sees a fig tree from the distance and he sees leaves 
And so he goes up to the tree to find fruit. Now, you won't really understand this text unless you understand Mark is writing this gospel. And here's what I love about my boy Marky Mark. Mark loves to make sandwiches. Is this too many food illustrations? Some of y'all are hungry. Read the gospel of Mark. Mark will make these sandwiches where he will start a story and then he'll interrupt that story with another story and then he'll finish the story that he started. And the reason he's interrupting the first story with another story is because the story that he's interrupting the original story with is intrinsically connected to the first story. It's a sandwich. So if you want to understand the story in the middle, you got to understand the story that he started at end with. And the story in the middle is your Savior going to the temple, walking around, and going up. What is Get out! Get out! Kicking people! I was going to do the table too, but my iPad's on there. <laughs> That's the story in the middle. But the story at the beginning is the fig tree. And he sees a fig tree. Let me pick this up. I ain't going to be all the way like Jesus. And the story at the beginning is because he sees a fig tree and he goes up to it and he sees the leaves, but there's no fruit. And he curses the tree. May no one eat fruit from this tree again. Really, Jesus? Is it that serious? You cursing a tree? What makes it more problematic is Mark says, it's not even the season for figs. You mad at a tree <laughs> that hadn't produced fruit and it's not even the season for it to produce fruit? Oh, y'all laugh. You understand there's people who've walked away from faith from this scripture right here. Like, I cannot handle a savior that is irrational, that's unreasonable, and that curses trees. I want a savior that cuddles trees. I cannot deal with this Jesus. And if you look at this text from the surface, you will miss the forest for the tree. Because the reason Mark... It's actually saying that it's no season for the figs. What he's really meaning is that it's not the season for the fruit to be ripe. That's what that means. But if you want to learn about fig trees, I learned this this week. Here's what you need to know about fig trees. Is that fig trees produce fruit before they produce leaves. You will always see a little bit of fruit first then leaves, then ripe fruit in the season. But figs start with fruit. Fruit comes before leaves. Oh, now we have perspective because Jesus looks in the distance and sees leaves, no fruit. That's what he wanted to eat. He wanted the little bitty fruit about the size of the almond. That's what he was hungry for. And this tree was posing like it had fruit because it had leaves. What gets Jesus angry? What makes him go off? I'll tell you what makes him go off. When he sees trees that have leaves but no fruit. When he sees trees that are taking up space in the earth that are posing with their leaves from a distance. But when you get up close to the life of the tree you cannot see any fruit. He cannot stand people who have a form of godliness with the leaves. But when you get up close, you don't see fruit in your life. He can't stand people that post pictures of leaves. But when you get close to their life, there's no fruit with the leaves. And the leaves are just a facade when there's no fruit in their life. Oh, it's tight, but it's right. You want to see him flip a table? Be real loud with your leaves. But let your life have no fruit. Because leaves look great from a distance. Oh, look at the way she lifts up her hands. I bet she is really spiritual. Did you see her post yesterday? Yes. Turn to Philippians chapter 4. Did you see all the highlighted places in her Bible? Leaves! If we get up close to you and we see your life, is there any fruit? I feel like coming down there. What does Jesus crave? Fruit. Isn't it crazy that the only time in the Bible Jesus said he was hungry was for fruit? He's a fruititarian. 
He just wants fruit. What do you want me to do in my life? Have some fruit. Fruit. How do I get fruit? I'm so glad you asked. Remember what he said in the last moments of his life in the Gospel of John? He says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Remain in me. Stay connected to me. Apart from me, you can't do anything. See, that's the power of fruit. You ain't never seen fruit be produced without being connected to the branch of a tree. Oh, now I see why you want fruit. Because there's no way it can have fruit unless I stay connected to you. And because you want me to remain in you and you remaining in me because you desire intimacy with me, I can't get the fruit until I stay connected. That's why you can take a whole lot of stuff away from me, God, but please don't ever take your presence. I've got to stay connected because if I lose my connection, I'll lose my fruit. Don't mess up my connection. Don't cut off my connection to the vine. If you cut off my connection to the vine, I won't have fruit. That's why I'll get off of social media because it'll break my connection. This one got time to be petty with you because I can't break my connection. I got to stay connected to the vine. Because apart from him, I can do nothing. Apart from him, I can do no thing. If you don't get anything else, I say, stay connected to the vine so you can produce fruit. What kind of fruit? I'm so glad you asked. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Say the last one again. Self-control. That's fruit. That's fruit. Try to produce any one of those by yourself. Huh. Try. Try. Try to produce self-control disconnected from him. I mean, I'll still mug the person in traffic that cuts you off. Don't you do it? You pull up right next to him so you can look at him. <laughs> fruit. God wants your life to produce fruit. Hear me, social people. Want to look at your life. Oh, God, let them look at our church and say, those are people who produce fruit. Their lives are fruitful. You know fruit is good for one thing. Before you start praying, God, give me fruit. Fruit is only good for one thing to be eaten. God said, I want you to take, have a life so connected to me that you produce so much fruit that people take a bite out of your life. That people take a bite out of your patience. You're like, woo, you are working my patience. That was a big bite too, but that's all right. I'm going to stay connected <laughs> to the vine. I'm going to cuss you out right there, but no, I'm going to stay connected. <laughs> you can't produce fruit without them. You got to stay connected to the vine. Why did he curse the tree? Because it was posing with leaves and had no fruit. Oh! I see what you're doing, Mark. It's the sandwich. Perhaps the reason you interrupt the story of the tree and start talking about the temple is because the temple, the church, has become just like the tree. The temple, as ornate as it was, as beautiful as it was, you should have seen this temple. 30 soccer fields wide, beautiful gold on the entrance. Priests decked out in Gucci robes. <laughs> All kinds of jewels on their chest. Forms of worship, all of it in place. Looks so good from a distance. Thousands of people would pilgrimage to, this, to see this, this temple because of its beauty. And they would stand in awe. But not Jesus. He looked from a distance, saw the leaves. But when he got up close, there was no fruit. And he treated the temple the way he treated the tree. Turning over tables. Kicking your savior. Kick people out. Get out! That's how I know he had authority. Can you imagine telling people to get out of a temple and nobody arrested him then? That's how you know he had power and authority. Can you imagine? Can you, go, go to the police station after this service and say, all y'all get out of here! <laughs> get out right now! Start kicking officers. Go somewhere! Be locked up in 30 seconds. 
They couldn't arrest him because they knew he had authority. They knew it was his house. He was functioning. Watch this. Ooh, I wish I had time. He was functioning as a prophet. Jesus is the only one who is prophet, priest, and king. And prophets curse trees. Prophets throw chairs. Prophets are not just to tell you, in 30 days you're going to win the lottery. No, true prophets will speak to the disparity between the will of God and what is actually happening in the earth. Prophets will address the gap between God's will and what is happening. And Jesus the prophet showed up in the temple and started flipping stuff because they didn't see fruit. I asked the worship team to join me. You know one of the things he didn't see? Because there was no fruit. He saw division. He saw division. This temple had separate courts. The priest had their own court. The Israelites had their own court. The women had a separate court, even from the Israelites. And then the Gentiles had their own courts. Here's what's funny about the stuck up, pretentious, pompous Jewish people at the time. They thought that the true Messiah was coming to wipe out the Gentiles from even being in the temple. And leave it to Jesus who comes and starts flipping over tables because guess where they set up all of the animals and all of the money changers tables in the temple. They didn't put it in the priestly court. They didn't put it in the court for the Israelites. Oh no. They didn't put it in the court for the women. They put it in the court of the Gentiles. So here are the Gentiles who are coming from afar just to connect with Jesus, just to bring their sacrifice of worship, are trying to worship in a space that has animals, that stinks, that has people yelling and screaming, and they cannot even find connection in the temple. They would have never put those changing tables and animals in the Israelite court. They put in the court of the people that they didn't think were his children. They put in the court of the people that they didn't think God should let in the house. So Jesus turns over the tables and lets them know, you don't get to decide who my children are. They had a wall that blocked the Gentiles from even going into another place. Signs on the wall saying, you'll be killed if you go past this point. Animals in the place that they came to connect with God. Now here's what's crazy. Here's the tension in the text. The animals were necessary to bring a sacrifice. So before you start using this scripture to say, well, they shouldn't sell merchandise in the church. Hold on. That's not the context of this verse. Don't use this scripture for that. Because you had to have an animal to bring your sacrifice. It actually started off as a service because people would come from miles away and you couldn't carry your own animal. So they actually started off to be kind so that you would have an opportunity at the temple when you wanted to worship to purchase an animal there. But I don't know when. All of a sudden they moved the money changers tables from outside of the temple to inside the temple. Over time, they started charging excessive prices for the cost of the animal. So that even a family that brought, that just wanted to get a little dove, a poor family was being charged five times the actual price of the dove when they just wanted to worship. They started raising the rates to exchange the money. I don't know when, but it just started happening. Please don't miss this. People don't become corrupt or lose God in an instant. They lose them in increments. Small compromises that you justify in your mind. And before you know it, you've lost your center. And Jesus is addressing it. You're taking advantage 
of the only thing I came to give my life for people you temple you priest you were meant to be a bridge for people to have access to my presence but something dangerous occurs whenever the bridge becomes a block whenever the person that's supposed to be a bridge to the presence of God actually ends up blocking people you want to see Jesus go off start blocking people from having access to this beautiful Savior. So he flips over the table and says, my house will be called not a house of preaching, not a house even of sacrifices. It's a house of prayer. Why prayer? Some of you don't even know what it is because you think prayer is just asking God for what you need. You think prayer is what the Pharisees did, some big religious thing where you use big words and try to impress God. You ever do that? Try to pray this fancy prayer so people say, mm, he can pray. Eternal, all-wise, omnipotent Father, your most humble servant has gathered under your auspicious presence to embark upon the mission of prayer. I am fully cognizant that thou art the God of galaxy, sky, space, and eternity. So would you from eternity look down on humanity and change the trajectory of my life? I offer this humble humble prayer from the deep recesses of my heart, soul, mind, spirit, and medubla oblongata. Thou are the father and the potter. I am the clay. Mold me for your purpose in the earth. What? That's not prayer. Prayer is just communing with him. That's why it's a house of prayer. Oh my goodness. And so you can connect with him. If you come to this church and you connect with a preacher, you just connect with a worship leader and you never connect with him, we've wasted our time. That's why it's a house of prayer. Because you're only there to be a bridge for people to connect with him. But you've made it a den of robbers. And God will always flip tables in my life and yours when things have gotten in the way that break your connection. Oh, it's easy to look at this text and say, well, see, that's why I don't like preachers anyway. That's why I don't like, oh, that's why I don't like worship leaders anyway. The whole church is commercialization. Uh, uh, uh. That's why I don't like the temple. Preach this sermon. Tweet this sermon. Podcast this sermon. I can't stand the temple. Oh, I hate the church. I hate the temple. Be careful. What did Paul say? Do you not know? that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. He'll turn over tables in your life. Anything that's blocking the communion and the connection. He's trying to get them back to the place that Adam and Eve had in the garden. The original temple where they were in his presence. Oh, Remember what they did after they sinned? They covered themselves with what kind of leaves? Fig leaves. Get the fig out my house. <laughs> so figs love to portray an image of connection without actually having deep connection to produce the fruit. My house will be a house of prayer. Would you stand to your feet tonight? Father, tonight, we give you permission to flip over whatever tables you want to flip over. God, we give you permission tonight. Not that we even have to give you the permission. All power and authority is in your hand. But God, I thank you that you will wreck systems, routines, traditions, to break your original intent to have communion with those that you love. God, I pray today that we would let go of a life that has leaves with no fruit. God, create a community here at Social Dallas of people 
whose lives are fruitful. Not because we're perfect, but because we remain in you and you remain in us. God, I declare that Social Dallas will be a house of prayer. It will be a place where people can come and connect with you. God, don't let the bridge become a block. This is a house of prayer. It's a house of miracles. Heads about eyes are closed in this moment. You'll be here tonight and you be so honest to say, you know what? I got a lot of leaves, but no fruit. So funny, even in Luke chapter 13, Jesus tells a story of a man who kept checking for fruit on a fig tree. And he was about to cut it down. He said, I've been checking. I see no fruit. It can't take up space. But grace speaks up and says, give it one more year. Some of you right now, God has been trying to get your attention. You've got a life of leaves professing a relationship, but there's no depth of relationship. He's calling you back to intimacy with him so your life can have fruit. Heads bowed, eyes closed. If that's you tonight, would you just lift up your hand as a sign to say, God, I'm, I'm coming back to that place of intimacy with you. I, I cannot live a life where I'm just going through the motions if there's leaves and no fruit. Maybe right now he's flipping stuff over in your life, and the reason he's doing it is because it's become something it was never intended to become. There's nothing wrong with the temple. It started off, God gave the design for the temple, but it became something it was never intended to be. We don't lose God in an instant. We lose it in increments, small compromises. He's calling you back. I see all those hands. Thank you, Jesus. Head still bowed. I'm still close. If you're here tonight and you've never taken that first step, which is to say, Jesus, my life is yours. Here's the real beauty of this passage is that for years and years, people had to bring lambs and goats and doves to cover their sin. But when Jesus flipped those tables that day, he was also saying, this temple is destroyed. This temple has an old system. I am about to go to the cross, and when I die on this cross, you will never have to sacrifice another lamb. I will be the ultimate sacrifice for all of humanity. That's good news tonight, that when he was lifted high, when they stretched him wide, when his blood was shed, how many are thankful it was enough to cover all of your sins, past, present, and future, so you don't have to walk in shame and condemnation his sacrifice was enough once and for all all you have to do is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that he is Lord with heads bowed eyes closed tonight maybe even watching online right there in your living room and you wonder why you can't turn off because God's presence is right there with you if you're here tonight you've not surrendered your life to him tonight's your night to say I'm coming home oh there's a place for you this earth is not your home. If you wonder why you keep running to things and they never satisfy, you keep changing houses and changing spouses and changing jobs, wondering why does it only give me peace for a moment but it never lasts, it's because this earth is not your home. You will only be satisfied in the presence of your creator. This is not a home. Earth is a hotel at best. 